Hey guys, welcome to Fringe FM, the show where we get the world's most forward-thinking folks. Today we've definitely got one of them, Ken Folta. Thanks for coming today, Ken. Uh, Kevin, not Ken, okay. sorry. Uh, you want, no, that's all right. It, it happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's luckily we're going to edit this. So we just improvise that completely. You've got a, you've got a really interesting background. I wanted to get you on to talk biotech because that is what you do literally talking biotech. So tell me a little bit about your background and then we'll jump into cutting edge state of the art stuff. Well, I'm really fortunate to have a background that's consistent with my present uh, career. I really wanted to be a scientist my entire life. I mean, ever since I was a little kid and started studying biotechnology really in about 1977, I was 10 years old, and really got into the idea of genetic engineering and you could move DNA around like Lego pieces. And this was really, you know, sexy and exciting. And when you started to see the things that were being done, like um, insulin and growth hormone and all of these interesting uh, revolutionary changes that at the time were huge promise for the future. Uh, this was rosy technology and we were so excited as so much promise. And then to see how it was uh, really held up and how the birth of the internet really slowed its progression and penetration uh, to do all the really good things that we could have done. And, and, and so that, that's my background and, and why I get so excited about biotechnology. Like what things, what could we have done? What are some of the things that held us up? Well, I think that, uh, that the first people to really start to work in agricultural space, um, no one really cared much about medical application. People got excited about medical application. But when the agrobiology or agronomic sector really started to introduce genetically engineered crops from the same companies that were uh, devising chemi chemistry. These were chemistry companies that were now dabbling in genetics. And that seemed to be kind of a toxic relationship for most people to fathom. And so the first crops that came out were, you know, big agronomic crops like uh, cold, sterile, gross things like corn, soybeans, and cotton. And weren't the warm and fuzzies like the, you know, the, the well, apples and things that people like in their diet. And so that um, really kind of led people down this road of uh, being very uh, skeptical, if not cynical, about what these technologies could do. And we forgot about the potential for nutrition and environment and disease resistance and all the good things that we probably could have done much faster if, if it would have been rolled out differently. The marketing was just so bad. So like Monsanto was marketing what they were doing for farmers. They weren't saying, hey, here's this pizza you can eat and it will give you six pack abs. You're not going to have this carb overload. You're going to be healthier and better. They, they marketed it more towards the B2B versus the B2C side, I think. Exactly. And, and, but those were the customers, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, their customers are farmers. Farmers are buying seed. Um, consumers like me, I don't go out and buy a 50 pound bag of uh, a corn seed. And they forgot about who the end user would be. And, the, and we're talking about technology. Sure, you got the consumer of the technology, the farmer, but the people that technology ultimately could impact, positively or negatively, is somebody who's downstream. And they have a very strong say-so as to the social license for that farmer to be able to use that technology. How do we balance technology and risk? I know we were talking a little bit before about biotech and the, the missing smoke alarm, but... There, there's a lot that can go right. Right now, we can't feed the world effectively because things are spoiling. We're not producing enough. But there's also a lot that can go wrong as well. Yeah, you know, and this is always the question for me as a scientist. You know, I, I can see throughout, and we all can see, that our ability to create technology is never as um, well, I should say, is much faster. So our ability to create technology is always faster than our ability to generate the wisdom to use it correctly. And I think this is something that, you know, you can talk about atomic bombs or, you know, whatever, uh, nuclear re reactors, you can talk about all kinds of technology and really see that we have to have new technology rolling out with an equal dose of care and analysis of ethics and other important considerations. And I think biotech was a good example of how it really did have that complimentary discussion, I think, at least in academic circles. The problem is, is that nobody folded in John Q. Public to ask them, how do you feel about this? And what do you know about it? And how can we better communicate what the reality of the risk is versus the reality of the, of the promise? Mm -hmm. 
I think there's also some risk as well as we start to mass produce more quantities, just having less biodiversity overall. If every species of corn or banana on the planet is the same, you run into, you run into the plague phenomena. Yeah, and I think we've seen that bottleneck behind us now. What's really interesting about that is that when you look at everything, if we, and, and when people talk about biodiversity and monocultures, this kind of thing, uh, the first thing they go to is, well, look at the corn across Iowa and how it's all one big monoculture. I think that's really not how I see it as a scientist, that as a plant scientist, I see our most extensive monocultures as things like bananas or um, grapes. You know, grapes, we've been using the same varieties, especially for wine, um, for a long time. And uh, the people in the wine world don't want to violate that monoculture. They want the same thing over and over again and reproducible and uh, predictable. Uh, when you look at corn and soybeans and some of our big ag crops, it's actually been a uh, bottleneck that we've weaseled through because of this genomics explosion. Because we can use these widespread DNA tools to understand all the genes in a plant we can start to go to wild populations and find genes that are associated with things like disease resistance or um, ability to grow through drought or stress because those wild plants do it without anybody's help. And they're repositories of tons of genes that if we could bring those into production varieties um, could give us better and better quality. And I think that we're starting to see that uh, the advent of that reality open up. And it's really exciting to see that the next generation of crops could be bringing in uh, genetics from the wild species and, and lending those uh, wild genes to make our new crops more diverse and um, better in terms of production and more sustainable overall. How do we balance the views of the public? So I think I see, I see some pros and some cons to what I see in terms of the anti-GMO movement. I would say certain things are, are certainly not good for human health. But I think categorizing or lumping everything together makes absolutely no sense because you are, some things will be good and some things will be bad. That's the nature of reality. So maybe certain types of, of crops, et cetera, might have problematic uh, implications for planets, ecosystems, et cetera. But other things, I mean, we, we crossbreed roses, so we have prettier roses and no one's getting upset about that. It's, it's like people kind of forgot about science and categorized everything as science as evil to some extent. No, that's an excellent point. I know that uh, when I look at a guy, like my interest is in plant genetic improvement and there's a billion, well, there's a dozen ways to do that. Um, we do everything from, like I mentioned before, cross in wild germplasm, where you're mixing tens of thousands of genes with tens of thousands of genes that you have no idea what most of them do, but nobody really cares. Um, you can use chemical agents like, uh, um, well, harsh chemical DNA mutagens and soak the seeds in it and damage the DNA. And once in a while, you get a seed that comes out with, a, with damage that actually is favorable. So you create new traits that way. Nobody cares about that. Um, nobody minds. We don't know what we change or why we change it, but it's different. And it's beneficial. So people are okay with that. But people get weird when we adjust one gene in a very predictable way. And as you mentioned, you know, most of the time, this is perfectly fine and acceptable, but we can all imagine ways in which it would not be and ways you could make things dangerous. And of course, you know, every single technology we roll out in genetic engineering has um, strengths and limitations. We understand that it saves the farmer money, but you know now you develop resistance to strategies. So if you have an insect resistance gene, farmers use less insecticide, but now you evolve resistance to that strategy. So it's always a, um, uh, an ebb and flow as we feel our way through what are ultimately the best integrated solutions to growing crops. How do we think that going forward, not just for crops, but for people, for animals, et cetera. Realistically, crops are kind of the first, the first step, so to speak, because people are slightly worried about doing it to themselves. But as you see someone else who's possibly getting genetic enhancements and being more intelligent, being sexier, being faster, et cetera, <laughs> that's going to become black market. That's going to go everywhere. It just will. It's the nature of humanity. How do you think about that? 
Yeah, that's a tough one because I look at all of these things through very rosy lenses. Like for me, all I, I think of everybody having the best intentions and everybody doing things for the benefit of everybody. And I, I love the medical applications that have already happened through things like gene editing. So this area of gene editing where I know you've, you've covered before on your podcast, but there are, there are children alive today. Um, because of gene editing, where they've had their leukemia resolved in, in ways that they couldn't have done before, um, by genetically engineered cells that were introduced to their bodies that, like a, uh, like a guided missile, went to the cancer and destroyed it. Um, this is reality. And this is uh, something that I see as being, you know, I think before we get to, you know, stronger, faster, sexier, um, I think we're going to see a lot more of those medical applications that will change the lives for people. I agree, but just eliminating disease. How, who are the last five people you, that you know that died? How many of them died from old age? And how many were from some type of disease, often neurological in nature? Well, and that's true. But I think it's the fact that we're defeating disease. Like uh, we're having early surveillance for things like heart disease. We're not dying from pneumonia. We're not dying from uh, uh, car accidents like we used to. And it's giving us the opportunity. And I, I always kind of say this, you know, with my tongue in my cheek is that we actually have the luxury of, of connecting with uh, long-term degenerative disease. You know, we're not, we're not uh, even when I was growing up, you had people routinely dying in their 50s of, of heart attacks or, or stroke or, um, or even, you know, mundane things like, uh, like I mentioned before, like uh, pneumonia. Um, it, it was a reality back then. Um, we're going to see uh, more and more of this. And as we begin to defeat things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other long-term uh, different cancers, uh, I wonder what the next wave of disease might be. I've seen a lot of people that have some pretty credible evidence that a lot of those diseases seem to come from imbalances, nutrient, uh, gut microbiome, et cetera. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people seem to, blame, um, seem to blame essentially what people are eating, which I think holds a lot of weight. If medicine's a food or if medicine's edible, then food's also kind of medicine in some sense. How do we think about that as a, as a plant geneticist? I, I, I put some weight in that. I think that uh, I don't know how much I, I'm excited about microbiome just yet. I see a lot of uh, data both ways, and you know, I think it's it's got a lot of sorting out to do. But it's an area that I'm glad people are looking at. But I know from my own personal experience, I think that our early developmental um, tendencies that when we start out early in life um, with good nutrition and uh, a sufficient exercise. I think this has long-term implications in our long-term health and uh, and uh, degeneration as it goes on. I mean, I'm 51 years old. I I grew up eating well and exercising, and I compare myself to my um, peers, and I see people who are uh, who are suffering from a lot of health disorders uh, at about the same age. Uh, a lot of people who struggle with weight, a lot of people who struggle with, and a lot of that's genetics coming in. And there's nothing you can do to change that yet. But I do think the things we can affect are those diet and exercise. And I think early, uh, early decisions can have long-term consequences. And generally speaking, if it feels like a bad idea, it probably is a bad idea. I want to jump into the cutting edge of, of plant genetics and where we're headed. Where are we going to be 5, 10, 15 years? What's the mind-blowing stuff that most people don't know about? Yeah, so the, you know, and this is what I think the big deal is in gene editing and our ability to um, make surgical changes to DNA in very rapid ways to create new traits. And I think what you're going to see are a couple of things. One, uh, like I mentioned before, we know the genes that give plants resilience and give plants disease resistance in the wild. And you just, uh, maybe we understand it from something like barley, but it, that same change doesn't exist in wheat. We can now create that change in wheat to make it resist a certain disease. That's really new, that's really happening, and that's going to be going on. Um, in plant biology, the other exciting thing is, can we take a wild plant, like a tomato, like a wild tomato, which is, you know, uh, economically, horticulturally useless, and introduce the same dozen changes that we see led to the domesticated tomato? 
And so that way it's keeping all of those wild genes while only changing the ones that make it good for consumers. Uh, the other place that I think you'll see some really stunning stuff is in the idea of conservation, in the area of conservation and maybe even de-extinction. Can we bring back uh, things that are where they're lost or maybe um, uh, on the edge of being lost by being able to give them a few traits to help them along? And I think these are really amazing places where you'll see some important changes in the future. For plants or for animals? I know the Woolly Mammoth Project looks fascinating. God, I love that stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Jurassic Park type stuff, but really Jurassic Garden. Um, there are strawberry species and other plants are alive today where a extinct genome is likely locked in their DNA. And can we tease that out and allow something that once was alive on the planet to come back? And from that, be able to analyze uh, how things changed and how uh, evolution changed them through time. I think that's all quite realistic. And you'll see some of that going forward. How do we avoid the, the in invasive species problem of, oh, I'm going to bring this plant over from Europe to the U.S. and suddenly it starts destroying the existing ecosystem, the, the Asian carp. I mean, th that's oh, yeah. a good animal example. That's a great example. The one other really good example is the fall armyworm. Uh, this is a, a insect that ended up in Africa uh, from the Americas where we can control it. You know, we have uh, insect insecticides, we have whatever, we have all kinds of strategies that we can control fall armyworm. This is a worm that when, or a larvae of an insect that when it is active uh, and actively growing is like a carpet and marches across a field and eats everything in its path. And it's indiscriminate. And uh, we can control it okay here, South America, you can control it. But in Africa, uh, there are people who have the word famine on their lips, looking at fall armyworm as an introduced species that may be devastating. How do we, how do we avoid that? And how do you think about solutions like the, the CRISPR gene drives for eliminating mosquitoes with malaria and the, the unintended butterfly effects? Yeah, yeah, but this is the point, is I think that, these, that we do have tools that can control it. You look at uh, the, the uh, gene drives. Gene drives are one thing, but there's a lot of uh, gene editing and some genetically engineered mosquitoes that look like they carry very, very little risk and could have profound effects at driving the um, uh, populations almost to zero and really suppressing those populations. And mosquitoes are invasives, the ones we have here in the States. Uh, the ones that are, you know, most pests are, uh, are invasives. And using these kinds of mechanisms to drive them down is actually pretty promising. Gene drives are something we've examined on our podcast and, and I do think um, have a lot of interesting social edges we need to think about. Um, and very careful analysis of risk. I think that's something that needs to happen with gene drives. What does the analysis of risk look like from a, from a biotech's perspective? How do people think about this? I know, yeah. I know the criticism of scientists in Silicon Valley is always, well, everything's going to be rosy, right? We're going to make Facebook and it's gonna, everyone's going to be happy. We'll all be connected. But it doesn't always work out. How do, we, how do you think about risk from the science side? I think that that's a major consideration for us, especially those of us that work in the public sector, because in order for us to you know, and, and it's kind of the old story. This is why we can't have nice things, right? All it takes is one uh, Frankenstein event, you know, one to escape containment and cause a problem. And it would, or something that have unintended consequences, and it would really put a patina of skepticism and arrest any of the technology from going forward. And that's why all of us really handle this with a great respect for risk and great analysis of risk. And it's one thing that drives me nuts is that I think we are so conservative, which is good, but it's to the point where good technologies that in the, in the industrialized world, uh, you know, we go, well, why would we want this? We have plenty of food, but then it sours the permeation of very good technology into the developing world. And I think there are things like fall armyworm or vitamin A deficiency that we have those solutions right now. They're, they exist. They could be deployed and save millions of lives a year, yet they're arrested because what I do believe are well-intentioned people in the West uh, don't allow those technologies to move forward. 
in the West. So does that mean China wins the biotech race? Um, ultimately, yes. Um, surprisingly, if you go there, the young people have been told because of uh, it's like Greenpeace and other organizations that are very vocal and on the ground there, um, they tell the Chinese people, you, this will, so in the, here in the States, they say, well, uh, if you eat these technologies or consume these, you might get cancer, you might get Alzheimer's, you might get autism. You know, these are the things that concern us here. In China, they say these will limit your reproduction. And in China, where they're just coming off of that one child policy, the negative messages are shaped to fit that population. And it works. Uh, young people in China are not excited about biotechnology, yet the government sure is. Um, the government has invested billions and billions of dollars in the next generation of crop and animal biotechnology. And they will um, beat us in the race. Ultimately, I would say by 2022, 20, 2025, 20, uh, tons of crops will be coming out of China with biotechnology uh, adjustments. Crops and people. I, I hear that. I hear that's happening. And in China specifically. Well, there's a lot of interesting social engineering going on in China with this. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of this new system where everybody will get a, a wellness rating based on the good things they do and their bad habits, and they're going to be monitored and scored. It's a, like a message uh, right out of Black Mirror. Um, and, uh, but, but China is going to really be accelerating the use of these technologies. And uh, sadly, places like the EU has said, we're not so high on these. Um, they'll be buying their crops from China in the next uh, decade. So I want to I wanna transition into some of the happier stuff. So in terms of the potential of biotech, one of the big problems that we all face right now is climate change. And at least most people listening to this program recognize that that is, in fact, a real thing. But what are, what are some of the possibilities? Like I'm envisioning trees that can pull more CO2 out of the atmosphere, et cetera. I know that may interfere with photosynthesis, but it, are things being looked at in that nature when it comes to the biotech realm? Yeah, there actually are a lot of people who are looking at tweaks on, on uh, photosynthesis to increase the efficiency and being able to, or, and it, but it doesn't even necessarily have to be biotech tweaks. What if you can find trees that naturally are better at carbon sequestration and bring, bringing carbon into their structure? So maybe a, a larger root mass um, that you're basically taking carbon from the air and putting it back into the earth where it came from. Um, not a bad idea. I mean, every carbon dioxide molecule out there came from a plant that fixed it and uh, 250 million years ago and uh, fixed it in the plant structure that then ended up uh, decaying and ended up as oil, right? And I mean, this is all we're doing is burning plants. And so there's kind of a poetic uh, justice in pulling that carbon dioxide out of the air and putting it back into the ground um, as a plant. Uh, there's a lot of other great stuff going on that can combat climate change, or at least I should say, deal with the fallout from, from climate change. Uh, plants that have better tolerance of salinated soils, plants that can have um, better resistance to uh, shorter periods of uh, drought or heat, uh, that would make tremendous change for farmers, especially in the developing world. And, and those are realities. Those are things that are in labs uh, and could eventually be used uh, in those contexts. What about clean meat? How do you see the development? Yeah, that's a really interesting one for me. I, I, I haven't been following it as much as, 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 I, as I should, but I do believe that that has some really interesting implications. I know that, uh, you know, when you look at farming and, and, and I've always said, if you don't like biotechnology and you don't like the companies that do it, stop eating meat because 80% of the corn and soy and, uh, and those crops are going towards animal feed. And so clean meat wouldn't just impact the agricultural animal industries. It also would have a profound impact on the uh, agro, um, the uh, corn and soy markets because so much of this is going into animal feed. So wide-ranging implications. And it would be great in terms of just the, just the extra space, the reduced pollution. It's, a, it's really exciting for me personally, what, what they're doing and where they're at. My understanding is three, three to four years-ish for cost parity for some of the leading startups. Huh. That's exciting shit. It's, that is very interesting. I, I know that a lot of uh, animal farmers don't, don't get too excited about that because right now they're already on such things. But this is the way that 
uh, business works. And this is, uh, you know, when, when the horse and buggy got beat out by the Model T, you know, things change. And, you know, your podcast and, you know, your work, it, we t- you talk about the blistering rate of change and how, um, you know, how are, how do we, as a nation and an economy, how are we going to adapt to this rapid change and take advantage of it rather than, uh, you know, sit in our old ways and, uh, and be victims of that change. And that's, uh, that's the point of the podcast. That's the point of everything that early we're doing is everything is coming much faster. How do you, uh, how do you make the biggest impact? What, uh, what are the biggest worries you have these days? Not necessarily what you're working on, but just in general. Yeah. My biggest worries, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, it, I'm unsure. I think my biggest worry is that I can't keep up with the information as fast as it changes that even in my discipline, there are change coming so quickly. And with new genomics technologies, our ability to create data surpasses our ability to analyze it and our ability to take the analysis and put it into useful outcomes. You know, a lot of people can create science for the sake of science, but application is always slow. And maybe my biggest worry is we can create new technology, create new opportunities, but the regulatory climate that we're in is so outdated and so um, inhibitory that places like China, where you have um, a, a less of a uh, uh, interest in, in strangulation by regulation, I think that they're going to move extremely quickly where we're going to be trying to figure out how to regulate it. We're not even going to be in a regulatory process. We're going to be too busy trying to figure out how to do it. And that is a genuine concern. It's a genuine concern, especially considering how health care costs are just ballooning. Mm-hmm. Well, health care costs are, are, are one central concern, too. I mean, when you look at um, the newest technologies and the companies that are doing it, it costs so much money to come up with a new type of therapy uh, and when you're looking in the area of now of uh, gene therapy, which is working, you're looking in different areas of uh, biotech solutions to things like cancers, uh, these new antibodies that are coming out and new therapies that are coming out, they are so inherently expensive, so inherently expensive to deregulate that if you want to get this treatment, it may cost you $10,000 or $100,000 per treatment. And is that sustainable from a... Uh, insurance standpoint or from, you know, uh, an access standpoint, that, that is also a central concern. So increased medical tourism, essentially people flying over to China, Thailand, et cetera, to get, uh, they've gotten the boob jobs and the butt jobs done. Now they're going to head over for other places for other things as well. Yeah. Well then the funny part in a, is on that is that with all of the reputable, you know, uh, molecular boob job and butt jobs you'll be getting, there's also going to be the guy who has the can of fix a flat who's, uh, you know, who's, who's going into a hotel room and giving you that kind of therapy. Um, you know, those examples exist of people having uh, harm from, uh, you know, being injected with silicone or in, in some cases fix a flat. Um, uh, you know, in a Mexican hotel room. Uh, will we see the same thing happening at the molecular basis? I, I wouldn't doubt it. You know, there's people who talk about now about uh, being able to do CRISPR in their garage, um, you know, gene editing in their garage. I don't think that it's at that point yet, but uh, it is an inevitable residue of people trying to experiment with technology on their own. Does that scare you when exponential technology is in the hands of the individual, possibly the individual who just got put on a medicine they shouldn't have been on? It, it, it's, it's, it's a risk, right? And I don't know that it concerns me too much because I, I'm wired weird. I, I think everybody's got the best of intentions. And I do believe that, um, that, uh, that we are over-regulated to the point where bad things are less likely to happen. Um, but, and, and, I, and people always say that. Well, what about uh, thalidomide? What about DDT? It's like, yeah, that's 60 years ago. Um, it's hard to see any modern equivalent of that because we've had such a good oversight. And with, um, you know, university science, there are so many people who would love to make a name from th- for themselves by showing that genetic engineering has deleterious consequences or whatever. Those would be earth-shaking revelations. But I think as we begin to get into these areas of gene editing and these new technologies, 
uh, there always is that possibility of someone doing something for um, a malevolent reason. Uh, years ago, there were people who engineered viruses to attack myelin, the stuff that covers your nerve cells, and have viruses that would lead to paralysis. These were biological warfare agents. And luckily, that stuff has always been kept under wraps. However, it is reality, and it's something that could be done. Um, you know, imagine the future of bioterrorism uh, being if we don't get what we want, we will release this. You know, that's the hard uh, toothpaste to get back in the tube. There was a great book by uh, Dan Brown looking at overpopulation and a plague to, to save humanity. The idea was if you knew that hum all of humanity would be dead in 100 years if you did nothing, would you be willing to kill 50% of humanity now? And kind of spoiler alert, he doesn't do it, but he makes a third of humanity infertile. So it fixes the problem anyway in terms <laughs> well, of overpopulation. But uh, I've, seen some, I've seen some pretty negative stuff about glyphosate. I just saw... Uh, a study published on uh, Hacker News yesterday or two days ago about bees and the effects on uh, local local ecosystems, et cetera. was curious to get your thoughts on the genetically enhanced crops and then the actual um, protectants, et cetera, insecticides, herbicides that were going into those. Okay, yeah, that's a really good thing for me to answer because I'm really familiar with this literature going back so far. And I'm also familiar with a lot of what people have said about it. And I keep an eye on the activist websites as well. You know, glyphosate um, is the chemical that's in the herbicide Roundup. And that's a formulation of glyphosate plus some stuff to help it penetrate the plant. It works in a very discrete mechanism. It interrupts amino acid synthesis in plants. So, um, amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So if you can't build new proteins, you can't make much of a plant. So the plant dies from starving for an amino acid. Um, it, it is a pathway that's different in humans. So we don't, we're not affected by the same way by glyphosate. And if you look at animal cells or humans, there's no really good evidence that there is any biological effect um, that anyone's really found reproducibly. So this seemed like a really good way to engineer a plant to be resistant to this herbicide. The herbicide's been around for a long time, about 40 years, and uh, kills plants indiscriminately, kills all plants um, with some modern exceptions. The idea was, if you can kill plants with this herbicide, what if you could engineer in a way to make the plant resistant? And so you can take the same pathway from bacteria. Some bacteria have the same synthesis pathway. You take that gene out of the bacteria and put it into a plant. Now that plant is not sensitive to glyphosate. And um, it work, works really well. You can spray a plant all day. It doesn't die. But the unprotected plants do. And this is why this was such a big breakthrough in biotechnology and crops because a farmer can plant glyphosate resistant corn, let it grow for a few weeks, then spray over the top with glyphosate and kill all the weeds, but leave the crop standing. So this is why it was such a good technology. It was a cheap chemical that allowed farmers to treat for $25 an acre, um, acres and acres of corn, soybeans, um, canola, uh, sugar beets. And those crops are ingredients in tons of food in the States or all over the world. So um, this is why that technology was so good. Uh, over time, the big drawback has been that as you use the same technology over and over again, that some of those weeds don't die and do very well in those fields and become resistant to the glyphosate. And that's really been the big problem with the technology has been the emergence of glyphosate resistant weeds all over the uh, United States, all over the world that now require new strategies to kill them. So it kind of takes this in the wrong. The cops get bulletproof vests and then the, the gangsters get the armor piercing bullets and you have to play a bigger and bigger game. Uh, that's kind of it. And, and what it, what it would have been, uh, what would have been better is if we would have had glyphosate resistance back in the 1990s and something else another one that could be used hand in hand with that. But again, we go back to regulation and the high cost and the barriers to regulation that for companies to bring this to market costs a hundred million dollars. And you don't know anything about if it's going to work, uh, you know, in a, in a large context or about social acceptance. So they only brought through one, you know, the glyphosate 
and then farmers loved it. They overused it, and now we're we have the problem of resistance. Understood. We could we could probably dive a bit deeper into that, but I want to look instead in some of the some of the technologies and trends you're most excited about outside of your work. What are you reading? What do you get pumped about? What uh what fascinates you? Well, I, I for me, uh, my interest is in how we can help issues in the developing world. Uh, you talked earlier about population and how we develop uh, ways of controlling population. And, you know, when you talk about, uh, you know, all of these doomsday strategies of, you know, viruses or, you know, infertility, I think the best way that you solve the population problem is by giving everybody nutrition, by giving everybody uh, good health and, um, and uh, smaller, and then they, as a result of that, you have smaller families. When people know that they're, that, uh, and, and education is the other part of that. You give education, nutrition, and medical, medical care, and populations control themselves. And we've seen this all over Scandinavia and other places in the world. How do we get to the developing world with more nutritious crops? How do we eliminate very simple problems? Well, I shouldn't say simple problems. Fundamental deficiencies, um, a micronutrient like vitamin A, a micronutrient like iron or zinc, Um, These are the things that lead to widespread health problems throughout the world in the developing world and um, lead to infant mortality and child mortality. And so parents are having more kids. They need help on the farm or they need help in, or they want to ensure that they're, uh, that that they'll have a child live to adulthood. So you have a few. Um, So I think that those kinds of technologies and biotechnology can solve those problems. Um, we can create plants that create more vitamin A. We can uh, have traditional food crops that maybe have more iron, more zinc, that can survive uh, times of heat and drought. Um, that's pretty exciting to me. And I think those are the ways that uh, that I would love to see this technology used. I think those are huge. And also, I like to point out to people when they're very much a naturalist. We had uh, we had Mike Selden of Finless Foods on. He's They're manufacturing lab-grown uh, finless tuna in a laboratory and this is kind of the only way you're going to eat meat in space well i imagine earth-based plants are not going to do that well in space we're going to have to genetically engineer those so if you want to eat anything in space it's probably going to have to have a bit of biotech uh, wrapped into it so to speak yeah well we actually started to develop the swiss army plant (laughs) our idea was could you have a plant that's of a generic form that in space you could you know, shine a blue light on it and it tastes like this. You give it a different color light, has a different flavor. You give it a different series of light pulses to make it produce a compound that would be potentially like glucosinolates that have potential anti-cancer compounds uh, uh, effects. Um, maybe you could uh, create a, uh, an antibiotic that you may only need for a short time in that plant. So having a plant that was wired to express different genes for different purposes that would give you um, different outcomes, that would be something that would be extremely valuable in space where you couldn't just send out to uh, you know CVS or Walgreens to get the medicine you need. Yeah, it's either that or we're all having those Soylent packages and we're just drinking some nasty, <laughs> some nasty smoothie for all of our calories. Well, I, I kind of like those. I, I, I was really excited about Soylent because um, it fit very much my, uh, my situation. I don't have time to think about planning meals. So if I get it all out of a bottle, it wouldn't bother me too much. But I fell in love with the company when they were the ones who said, made proudly with genetic engineering. We use genetically engineered soy because it's good for the planet and good for farmers. And I thought that was rather uh, an interesting spin on, uh, on their product and, and shows that they're thinking consistent with the science. Yeah, a lot of times you see people and the way they think is, is backwards. Like made in the USA, that's probably not necessarily a good thing. It's gonna be lower quality, higher, uh, higher cost, et cetera. Um, that's, a, that's a whole nother story. Um, what, uh, what is one thing that uh, most people don't know about your industry, about biotech, about what you do that you would wanna share with people? Well, I think that, uh, that the, and, and so, you know, my industry, I, I always have to be a little careful with that. You know, as a university professor, I serve many different industries. Yesterday, I was on a, um, yesterday, I was working at a farm that does uh, organically raising different uh, greens, and they do this by circulating uh, fish water to aquaponic, hydroponic, you know, marriage there, and uh, really cool stuff. And so, you know, I serve so many different industries here in my state from strawberry to citrus to everything. 
uh, I really don't have any direct integration with the biotech industry other than, um, you know, I certainly communicate with them and give them pointers on how they can better tell their story. Um, our new, and in a one program in our laboratory does have some very cool biotech edges that the big companies are interested in um, and have supported, which is great. Um, but the biotech industry, whether you're talking about animals, whether you're talking about plants and not so much medicine, um, the thing that people misunderstand is that the companies themselves uh, you know, may have insidious pasts and may have bought companies that have done some really bad things, like Dow DuPont being part of uh, having absorbed Union Carbide, you know, who killed all those people in Bhopal, India in the 80s. Um, but the companies today are mostly structured as seed companies, and uh, especially the big M, you know, Monsanto is a seed company. They're not so much a chemical company anymore. And people don't remember that. And they also don't realize that these companies sell seeds that are not just genetically engineered, but all kinds of seeds. So the organic seeds that are going in the ground on the organic farm may have come from these companies as well. Um, the other interesting thing is, is that uh, a lot of my students and former colleagues and people I went to school with have gone to these companies and have had wonderful careers. So they're not just these, you know, big dungeons on the hill. Um, they actually have uh, found very enjoyable times in those companies. Um, certainly wasn't for me. Um, I've had opportunities to move in those directions and I, I never wanted to. I like it in academia. I can't believe Bayer bought Monsanto. Bayer cares so much about their reputation and Monsanto just does not have the best one. For, for better and for worse, they don't. Uh, that was surprising. Yeah, I think it was that they wanted the seed catalog. Um, Bayer had for a long time developed their own um, crops and their own seeds and uh, never really had the same catalog that Monsanto did. Monsanto had very deep resources and uh, both genetically and data and everything else um, and a very good team in the field of how to sell and deploy these things. So I think that's what Bayer wanted. Um, Bayer sold all of their seed interests to BASF so it, it, it just, the seed catalogs changed hands. And since Monsanto was principally a seed company, uh, no longer a, uh, a chemical company per se, that uh, Bayer wanted that as part of their portfolio. And that's what they got. got <laughs> Along with the baggage. <laughs> Along with the baggage. Exactly. I got two last questions. First, what is the future of farming? Is it large scale production or is it small scale and decentralized? Yeah, it's going to be both. I think you're going to see a lot of bigger scale. You're going to take what's there now and automation and mechanization will make farmer go bigger, farming go bigger. You will see, but um, you will see uh, harvesting done by robots. Uh, that's starting to happen already. You're going to see remote sensors throughout fields that talk to the farmer and talk to a central computer that say, uh, turn on the irrigation in sector 14, but not in 15. You're going to see drones and rovers, rovers that walk in the field and sniff for specific compounds that would say, uh, over here we have a bad case of Phytophthora just starting to grab hold over here in sector 18. And then a drone will fly in and spray the correct fungicide only in that spot. Um, you're going to have weeding done by robots. You're going to have all of this stuff much less reliant on large scale uh, application of chemistry or uh, crop protection. And you're going to see this done very surgically. Um, that's, that's a reality. Labor will be eliminated. Uh, it costs too much to have people do that kind of work. Uh, immigration rules are changing the face of the people that are allowed to do that work. Um, and in my opinion, People shouldn't have to do that kind of work. It, it's backbreaking. It's horrible work. It's repetitive. Um, people should be spending their time with other things. And let's, uh, let's re let have robots do it. So you'll see that large scale will become more large scale. At the same time, uh, I love the emphasis on local. I love the emphasis on fresh. I love the emphasis on variety and specialty crops. And I think you're going to see, um, you know, the, the more emphasis on the farm down the street, and, um, uh, you know, uh, urban uh, old factories being converted into farms. Now, my lab does a lot of this. We're really interested in the lighting for those types of scenarios. So I think you'll see a lot more of that, too. And I think that's just so exciting. I think hydroponics will be very interesting as, as 3D printing becomes more mainstream and we need less container ships. What are we going to do with all these containers? 
Mm-hmm. No, no, I, I yeah. actually do this at home. I have a really nice hydroponic setup uh, where I am. Um, my, uh, we, we have a small operation at my place where we do um, farm direct or market direct um, produce and eggs and things like that. And uh, that's the kind of thing that we've been working on. And the big thing there is tapping into uh, people's interest in not just the same old thing. Uh, you can't sell a dozen more. You know, you, people want the blue ones and the and the purple ones and the green ones. They still have the same stuff on the inside, but but they want variety. And um, we've been working on ways to change the diet of poultry so that you can get a better quality egg yolk, you know, higher in carotenoids and things like that. Uh, we've also experiment, been experimenting with unusual crops that people never have seen. So um, when we have something like uh, pepinos or uh, Barbados cherries or um, tamarillos, uh, what is it? A bun apple. A bun apple? Yeah, no, I haven't seen those yet. But, but we have a lot of interesting fruits and vegetables that people are excited to try. And that's what I want is bringing more, more variety and more options to people to try new things. It's a fascinating future, and I'm sure it's making some of us hungry, so we need to start to wrap this up. One last question. If you had to leave people with something, a quote, a call to action, et cetera, what would it be and why? Wow, um, that's a tough one. I think that uh, a, a call to action should be, um, I would like to see people investing more in other people and in bigger ideas and community ideas. And, uh, you know, the that my my personal interest is how do I leave this rock a little better than I found it? And I think learning about the realities, learning who to trust about information about science is so important. And in a day of the internet and the noise in the internet and predatory publishing, that's very hard to do. But I would urge people to really seek the experts and and pay attention to the consensus and let's make really good decisions that can benefit people and the planet. Amen. And we got to throw a plug in here, guys. Fringe FM, you can make a tax deductible donation. If you go to fringe.fm slash support, we're working with a, we're working with a nonprofit. So if you want to avoid paying Uncle Sam and instead help us make the world a better place by sharing science and technology, fringe.fm slash support. And now you, Kevin, where's the best place for people to find you online and learn more? Yeah, so I, I love being on Twitter. I'm at Kevin Fulta, just like it sounds. And uh, also have a personal, I mean, a professional Facebook page uh, that's at Kevin M. Folta, and then uh, the Talking Biotech podcast. Once a week, we talk about areas of biotechnology and in crop and animal domestication. So really fun stuff. It's a fascinating future. I'm so excited we had you on. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. And cheers, guys. We'll talk to you again soon.